But when you start to clean things up and you clean up your diet, you're dumping all of this inflammatory fluid that looks like massive weight loss, but and it is weight loss, but it's not fat loss. So when we're inflamed, we're carrying extra fluid and it's around the cells, not inside the cell. We want the fluids to distribute across the membrane of the cells in a very um, sort of diffuse way back and forth. And when I have omega-6 integrated into the cell wall and I'm inflamed, ba basically what happens is the water stays outside the cell instead of the cell looking like a plump grape, it starts to look like a raisin and everything gets inflamed. So when we look at the inflammation process, it drives weight gain through all of those different mechanisms. And then it drives aging, right? Insulin going up is aging, inflammation is aging. So we go gray, we get wrinkled, we get tired, we start to age more rapidly. So it's also leading to that. Welcome to the Menopause Mastery Podcast, a show for women just like you who are ready for more health, vitality, passion, living life with a purpose. I created this show because I knew that women just like me in this second season of life, the season of menopause, are really tapping into their deepest desires. And we're ready to harness our physical and mental health and explore what our true passions are and peel back the layers to uncover exactly what we want out of life. I'm your host, Betty Murray, part geek, part magician, and your new medical bestie with a dash of sass. I love taking the complex science and making it easier to integrate into daily life. So let's join the journey to make this season the best ever. Welcome back to Menopause Mastery. So today I'm going to talk about the silent killer that may be leading to your weight gain, the aging process, and definitely can contribute to weight loss resistance. And I'm going to go through the top 10 causes of this silent killer and then what you need to do about it. So what is that silent killer? So that silent killer is inflammation. And actually, I believe it was Mark Hyman. It may have been someone else, but I believe it was Mark Hyman years ago called it inflammaging. And here's the simple fact is inflammation is a natural process inside the body, but inflammation when it is chronic and pervasive is when we see this rapid increase in aging. We also see a rapid change in metabolic function and we see the cause of all chronic disease. So every disease state, it doesn't matter which one you're talking about, has a relationship with the process of inflammation. So at the end of the day, the more we can do in our own life and take agency over inflammation, the, the better our life is going to be, the less likely we are to have inflammatory conditions and aging, and it's also going to help reduce the waistline and make you feel better at the same time. All right, so let's get into it. So the first, the first cause of inflammation is the standard American diet. So the standard American diet, which is ripe full of processed foods, high fructose corn syrup, chemicals, additives, seed oils, way too many calories, way too many carbs, way too much sugar, and just poor food quality. So it also lacks nutrient density and lacks vitamins and minerals. So the standard American diet is probably the biggest driver of inflammation and really the, the reason why we see such obesity epidemics in the United States, especially since the 80s. I don't know about you, but you know, when I was a kid, um, my dad was overweight. So my dad was overweight. But for the most part, every everybody, there was a very small percentage of people that were overweight. And if we really look at everything that's happened since the 80s, you know, depending on who you're looking at, the assumption is one in three of us are going to have diabetes over our lifetime in the United States. Uh, up to 88% of us are insulin resistant. And so we have a, a epidemic. And ultimately, the standard American diet is a big, big driver of that because all of those things that I just lifted, listed off rapidly all lead to inflammation, right? So in the United States, when we export our diet, we actually make all of these things worse. So countries that adopt our eating, uh, uh, our eating activities actually see an increase in all-cause mortality as they become more westernized. So standard American diet is a really big problem. And so that that really underpins everything that, that we see in the United States. Now, let me step back because I want to talk about what inflammation is and why we have inflammation. So inflammation is 
absolutely important to our immune function. So I'm gonna give you an example. So let's say I cut my finger. And when I cut my finger, my body is going to send a, a fat to that area. So there's a, a fat called a prostaglandin, right? A, it's arachidonic a acid. So arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6 fat, actually initiates the inflammatory process. So it says, hey, there's something here going on. We need to correct this. And so that inflammatory process then turns on white blood cells. It helps platelets aggregate, which helps you clot. So that is in fibrinogen and other things that helps you clot so you don't bleed to death. And it helps the immune system respond and bring, bring localized inflammation so we can start to improve the tissues. And then also it brings the immune system so it can kill off pathogens and other things. So the inflammatory process is absolutely required for us to be able to survive on the planet or we wouldn't be able to survive just a simple injury. But it's when that, that inflammatory process is amplified and especially when it's chronic all the time. Now, one of the things that's very interesting is that when we look at inflammation, not all of us have the same inflammatory response as others. You know, so if we look at the second cause I want to talk about, just because people think about this, and it's not a big, big cause, it's actually a lot of other things, but genetics can play a role also, and I'm not going to go into all the different genes, but particularly the APOE gene, so that's APOE APOE gene, and that one is associated with Alzheimer's, so that's been called the dreaded Alzheimer's gene. It's also associated with hypercholesterolemia and overall inflammatory response and cardiovascular risk. Now that gene encoded for an in, a increased inflammatory response, and that came about when humans went from something that was more ape-like to human over that sort of transition in our evolution. And what it allowed us to do was actually uh, survive inflammatory needs because we actually climbed out of the trees, started eating a more omnivore diet and chasing our food. So at that point we had to be able to handle more injuries, uh, transversing over time, feast and famine. And so the inflammatory response actually in some ways helped us kind of survive and per, be more pervasive over the um, environments across the world, right? So inflammation appropriately handled is necessary for immune function, for us to fight infection, for us to recover from injury. We need it right? So we need it. So genetics can play a role. APOE plays a role, but there's other inflammatory genes that sort of add up, you know? So depending on who we are genetically, some of us have a much greater inflammatory response. So if I'm an APOE4, or if I happen to carry a 4-4, my capacity for inflammation is exaggerated relative to somebody who happens to be, let's say, a 2. So a 2-2 actually has reduced inflammatory response, reduced risk for Alzheimer's, at least looking at current data today. So even genetically, we have somebody that may be slightly more at risk for inflammation. But all of the other things I'm going to talk about today are the contributors to inflammation, which are all your epigenetics, right? Those are the things that you can modify and change. I can't change my genes. I, you've, if you've listened to my show, you've heard I played my actual genetic results uh, with a DNA company uh, talking to Kashif Khan. And so I don't have great genes. I've got a lot of genes that like encode for inflammation, which is great if I'm injuring myself, not great if I'm trying to live as long as possible and stay as healthy as possible. But the important thing is your epigenetics, which are the things that you can modify and change, those are what really turn that gene up or down, and those are the things we can modify. So that's what we're going to go through today. So first off, like I said, standard American diet, every time we export it, people get heavier, they get more inflamed, they get more diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, you name it. And a matter of fact, if anybody's watched some of the Blue Zone documentary on Netflix right now, uh, they were going through some of the Blue Zones. And, uh, you know, a couple of the Blue Zones, like Costa Rica, has seen a decrease in their Blue Zone numbers. So a Blue Zone is a high concentration of population that live over 100 years. And when you look at these individuals, they have very low disease rate. They um, have very little dementia, all the things that we worry about. And what's true for them is they live a very traditional lifestyle. They have high connectivity 
and and their their diet is very regional and very um, varied, so they eat seasonal. But really, when you if you watch that documentary, I highly recommend it because what you start to notice is as a nutritionist, I care about food. I do, and you should care about food too. But there's many other things that have nothing to do with the purple potato or the amount of curcumin you eat. Right? You cannot surpass connection and 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 import in your life and having purpose and having community with purple potatoes and curcumin right so you have to, you have to do these other things right so so when we look at it the standard american diet when they looked at costa rica costa rica had a, a, a rural area that had high concentrations of centenarians people lived over 100 but as the americanized diet moved in that those numbers dwindled rapidly right so here's the thing if you go into the grocery store and you eat through the middle section of the grocery store, if you spend any time in that section, you are basically eating the standard American diet. So the rule is don't buy things that are boxed, bagged, or advertised, right? So if you if you spend your time on this, the out exterior of the walls, right, where the vegetables are, the meats and proteins, the fruits, and you stay away from all the packaged foods in the middle, you're going to reduce the amount of standard American diet products that you're eating and then you're going to be eating better and obviously that means staying away from fast foods and other things like that so what is in the standard american diet that is so bad so i want to talk first about sugar high fructose corn syrup and preservatives right so sugar high fructose corn syrup sugar and high fructose corn syrup are not only sweeteners but they are also preservatives So they are in almost every packaged food that you have, even when they don't taste sweet. So for instance, you might look at a loaf of bread and you're like, well, bread isn't super sweet, but it's often the second ingredient in the bread itself. It's actually going to be high fructose corn syrup because that's what allows the bread to sit on the shelf for two to three months before it gets hard and crusty and grows mold. And so even your whole wheat, seven grain, sprouted, whatever, is going to have some level of sugar in it as a preservative. So sugar is absolutely a preservative. And then sugar is also added to foods because it also makes it taste good. It's palatable. As humans, we like sugar because it, it, um, it shows our brain and our body, hey, we've got some high-ticket foods. These are foods that are going to give us energy because, again, our body thinks we're starving. We were wired to starve and fight and, and and go through famines so carbohydrate content tells our body hey we, we've got sugar coming once it gets broken down we're going to be able to use this for energy so we have a lot of a lot of taste buds for sweet we like sweet we self-define by sweet some of us more than others and so we also get a, a, a little boost of serotonin when we eat sweet things so we get a little bit of that feel-good chemistry on top of it so we are drawn to sugar foods Now, high fructose corn syrup is also added to just about everything. So your ketchups, your dressings, your marinades, and other things. And high fructose corn syrup has a slightly skewed level of fructose to glucose. And what that does is it it is inflammatory. It increases triglyceride activity and fat storage. And it's the one thing absolutely outside of the next thing I'm going to talk about that we have radically changed in our diet since the 80s, the late 80s, and it absolutely should be withdrawn from the food market. But it's not going anywhere, and they're even calling it corn sugar and other things to try and make it sound better. So those two things absolutely are pro-inflammatory. They they drive insulin resistance. They increase liver um, detox issues, and they're going to drive weight gain, particularly centrally around the abdomen, and your body fat makes inflammatory cytokines, right? The most active inflammatory um, tissue in your body is your body fat. So the more fat I gain, particularly in the abdominal area, underneath the muscles, not the jiggly bits, girls. I know we hate the jiggly bits, but they're actually more protective. But it's that fat in and around your organs is highly, highly active and produces a lot of inflammation. And so it drives insulin resistance and it drives that inflammatory bus and it becomes a self-fulfilling circle around and around and around. So sugar, added sugar in particular, is bad. Now, most of us do not have a little sugar bowl sitting on our table. My grandmother had a little sugar bowl sitting on her table, and she knew exactly how much sugar she added to her foods. If you walked into somebody's home today and you saw a sugar bowl sitting on the table, you would be aghast. It'd be like somebody having a line of cocaine out on the table, right? Nobody does that. But the simple fact is you're eating hundreds of pounds of sugar 
a year that you don't know you're eating because it's hiding. So again, if you stay away from processed foods, we don't have to worry about added sugar and high fructose corn syrup because the sugar that naturally occurs in fruits and in even tiny amounts, the carbohydrate, even in vegetables, has fiber with it and that is protective. So the next thing is seed oils. So your seed oils are your things like canola oil, grape seed, or not, sorry, uh, grape seed is a, is a, is a um, seed oil, but particularly the soy, the corn, the use of canola oil. So these oils are extracted from these seeds through a heating process and through a chemical process. So they add chemicals and bleaching chemicals to these, these oils and that makes them go bad. So it makes them rancid. And they are, uh, seed oils are very high in omega-6 fats. So omega-6 fats are prostaglandin. Arachidonic acid is one of those. Omega-6 fats are what initiate an inflammatory response. So think of that as the ringleader to get all the inflammation started. So if I'm eating a diet really high in omega-6 fats, particularly these rancid, bleached oils, what's going to happen is I'm going to have an inflammatory response that's going to be amplified. Now, what makes this problematic is those same oils get incorporated into your cell membranes and your mitochondrial membranes. So your body uses fat to make those little walls, right? So depending on what fat you eat, that's what you're going to get because it can man can't manufacture what it doesn't take in. Uh, your fats are essential. So your omega-3s, which are your collectively your fish oils, right, EPA and DHA, also alpha-linolenic acid, which is found in flax and walnut, those are anti-inflammatory. So if you don't eat flax and walnut and you don't eat cold water, wild-caught, you know, Pacific salmon and sardines and mackerel, you're not getting omega-3s in your diet. And omega-3s actually come in as a traffic cop and tell the inflammation to go away. They resolve. They actually make a thing in the body called a resolvin and a marisin. And the resolvin and the marisin coming from EPA and DHA is the traffic cop, cop that comes along and says, hey, all right, we, you were inflamed. We, need, we took care of what we needed to do. Nothing to see here. Move on. So if I don't have omega-3s in my diet and I have a diet high in omega-6s, I'm going to be massively inflamed. And then my body wants to use omega-3s in that cell membrane. It makes the membrane more fluid. It makes it more permeable. It makes the receptors, which are the keyholes on your cells, able to communicate better. So your hormones work better. Your transport of glucose and fat across the wall gets better. Your electronics of the cell gets better. Your energy production and all of that, ATP, all get better when you have omega-3s. So if I'm eating a diet high in seed oils and I don't eat mackerel and sardines and cold water salmon and I'm not taking a high quality fish oil, which I highly recommend, I'll put one in the um, show notes so you can have that. If you're not taking that and you're not getting at least 2,400 to 4,000 milligrams a day of EPA and DHA, this is a study coming out of Harvard Heart, the, the gentleman that figured out the, the resolve in the traffic cop figured out how that gets made and actually how to synthesize that found in their research that you need 2,300 to 4,000 milligrams of specifically EPA and DHA, not just all omega-3s, EPA and DHA a day in order to make the traffic cop. Most people, even if they're taking fish oil, unless they're taking a higher amount, are not getting enough. Now, on the other side of that, that does not mean take 6,000 or 8,000 because it's better. There's a U-shaped curve when you look at omega-3s. We need to be able to respond with an appropriate response. So anywhere between 2,300 and 4,000 is probably the right amount. So you want to take fish oils. The seed oils, you want to remove them. So you want to not eat commercial marinades, salad dressings, uh, uh, things like mayonnaise, depending on which kind you eat. You want to look for these oils hiding in things. And they're often used, again, in processed foods. So cookies, crackers, chips. Look, I, look I'm from Texas, and, and Mexican food is a food group to us. And, you know, my bane of my existence, I don't have a sweet tooth, but, man, salsa and corn chips are like my kryptonite. And so, like, finding a decent corn chip is almost impossible, right? So if I reduce those seed oils out of my diet, they're not getting incorporated into my cell membrane. I'm not getting this increased inflammatory response from omega-6 fatty acids getting made into arachidonic acid. I'm having less inflammation. 
Um, processed chemicals. So the next one is processed chemicals. So in our food supply, all the flavoring agents. So when it says natural flavorings, you know, um, autolyzed yeast extract, MSG, all of those flavor enhancements that you read about are chemicals, mostly made from petrochemicals, um, that are added to the foods that make it more enriched tasting. They dysregulate the, the, the amygdala in the brain, so they turn on the kind of pleasure centers, so your body wants more and more of those things. They dysregulate your body, and they dysregulate the hypothalamus, and so those food chemicals can drive more inflammatory response. So again, if I stay away from you know food colors and all of those additives, I'm going to get less and less of those things in my diet. Now, everybody's going to hate me when I say this. Alcohol. Alcohol is inflammatory. Flat out. Alcohol, whether it's wine, tequila, beer, um, hard kombucha, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Alcohol is inflammatory to the body. It, it depletes the, the liver of glutathione. Your, your body has to detoxify it. When you have alcohol around food, your body is actually going to detox the alcohol before you start digesting food. And so it is pro-inflammatory. Now, with that being said, does everybody on the planet need to stop drinking alcohol? You know, if you were to ask me biochemically if alcohol is, should be taken out of the diet for the most optimal living, I would say yes, that's true. Now, could you have a glass of really clean, clean low sulfite, low sugar wines? Um, I happen to love dry farm wines because they are probably the cleanest wines you can get on the planet. They're also low in alcohol. Uh, they have less, uh, less than one gram of sugar per serving, and they have no added sulfites, which are toxic. So how much you drink and where you drink makes a difference. And in full disclosure, I do drink wine. I don't do it a lot, but I do drink wine. I occasionally have tequila. But at the end of the day, I recognize that these are pro-inflammatory. So if I'm going home and I'm having, you know, two glasses of wine while I cook dinner and then the mommy glass when everybody goes to bed at 930 and I wonder why my sleep is disrupted and I feel puffy the next day and I don't feel generally good, it's because my body had to detox that. And it slows down my ability to detox other things like estrogenic compounds and the other toxins in my body and depletes the body of glutathione, which is your major antioxidant. Um, being sedentary, right? So actually not getting physical movement and exercise will drive greater inflammation. And it's because of the interplay between being sedentary, your cortisol levels and insulin. So insulin goes up, cortisol is going to go up with it. We've got this sort of interplay and we were meant to move. So not being physically active and or being way too physically active. So exercise is a dose dependent thing. Now, the majority of you hopefully are exercising. I would say the majority of Americans particularly are not exercising enough, but you can also overdo it. And I've had a lot of conversations on my podcast on different episodes talking about appropriate exercise, but being sedentary will drive inflammation also. Uh, we also have stress, right? And I've talked about stress a lot because cortisol is that prolonged, protracted stress response. And every time cortisol gets dumped out into the body from the adrenal glands, your body's going to mobilize sugar and it's going to mobilize insulin at the same time. Anytime insulin is elevated, you're going to have an inflammatory response. And your body, when it's putting sugar into the bloodstream, your body uses insulin to keep that under control. So at any given time in a human body, your body wants to keep that blood sugar to a teaspoon. That's what it's doing. So if it goes above that, it's going to pump out insulin to control it. If it goes below that, it's going to pump out some glucose from the liver. So your body keeps a tight rein on that. But if I'm constantly driving the stress train and moving glucose into the bloodstream and moving insulin into the bloodstream, I'm going to have this chronic inflammatory response. And then the last two are really some of the things that are part of why we have an inflammatory response, but can contribute to chronic inflammatory response, particularly when we start seeing things like digestive disorders, autoimmunity, um, even cancers. And that's really uh, the idea of infections and dysbiosis. So infections are obviously viral infections, bacterial infections, um, your fungal infections. Those are, those are uh, usually found because we get them in our environment in some way and they sort of try and take over like a virus tries to take over your cell and they try to replicate themselves or bacteria multiply rapidly and they make us sick and same thing with fungus right so the inflammatory response 
is designed to actually respond to these pathogens, right? So pathogens and the entire inflammatory response to pathogens are how we survive. So in a lot of cases, a, an infection and our inflammatory response is an appropriate natural response. But what becomes problematic is when it's a chronic infection or a chronic bacterial infection, chronic fungal infection that's driving this inflammatory response all the time, that becomes problematic. You know, things like mono becoming Epstein-Barr, becoming kind of chronic Epstein-Barr and, pro and probably a contributor to chronic fatigue. And, you know, give a COVID as an example. COVID along with Epstein-Barr possibly playing roles in long-haul COVID, right? So that inflammatory response that comes from the infection, if it doesn't come down and the infection doesn't get under control, we have chronic inflammation. And that leads to aging, but it also leads, leads to all-cause mortality. And it can lead to weight gain and everything else. Um, and then dysbiosis. So if I'm eating or, ha or living the lifestyle that I just outlined, these 10 different things that lead to inflammation, I'm going to have changes to my gut microbiome. And when that gut microbiome changes, you know, think of it as a jungle and we want a little bit of everybody in there. So if I have a very inflammatory diet, I have an inflammatory sedentary lifestyle, I'm eating a bunch of packaged processed foods with a bunch of toxins in it and a bunch of sugar and seed oils. I'm going to grow the cockroaches and the snakes in my jungle, which is your gut, right? So think of it as the gut microbiome. You're growing these unfavorable, these unfavorable um, animals, right? And so when that happens, then the, the, the gut function gets impaired. And what we're starting to see now is that not only do we see changes in the inflammatory response and sort of a perpetuation of inflammation because of dysbiosis, but we see changes in how your liver detoxes and how your estrogens get metabolized and your other environmental toxins. We can also see changes in drug metabolism. So your microbiome will change medications and how they work. Right? There were some really good studies that looked at bioaccumulation of different medications and the, the accumulation and the actual outcome of the, of the drug function were completely different depending on the microbes inside the gut. So what that tells us is, is our gut microbiome is the next frontier of health which is why I was studying it, and particularly around women's hormones, because I know that it's not really just what we eat, it's what we eat and what our microbiome does with it and how they interact with our food that probably has even a bigger degree of, of impact on our overall health. So taking care of our gut health is really, really important to the inflammation process. Now, how do all these things contribute to weight gain, right? So if we look at weight gain, insulin resistance, inflammation and cytokine production, especially from the fat cells or in anywhere else, they just start to ratchet it up, makes you more insulin resistant, makes your liver congested so you're less capable of kind of detoxifying what you're doing. And we also see changes in metabolic function like hunger and appetite control. Other hormones, probably like glucagon, are probably affected. I haven't seen any studies looking at that. But we see a metabolic impact of that inflammatory condition. And your body actually will retain fluids. So the other thing is a lot of people will say, Betty, I feel puffy. Right? So if you ever watched Biggest Loser and you saw this radical weight loss in those individuals in the first couple of weeks of when they went into the program. Now, I'm not a fan. They actually used to reach out to us when they were doing their casting call. And there was no way I was going to introduce any of my clients to that process because they had very specific health concerns they were looking for because it would lead to dramatic TV. But you would see these people drop massive amounts of weight in the very beginning and that's because they were so inflamed that every single cell had like a little moat around the cell because it was so inflamed. So when you start to clean things up and you clean up your diet, you're dumping all of this inflammatory fluid that looks like massive weight loss, but and it is weight loss, but it's not fat loss. So when we're inflamed, we're carrying extra fluid, and it's around the cells, not inside the cell. We want the fluids to distribute across the membrane of the cells in a very um, sort of diffuse way, back and forth. And when I have omega-6 integrated into the cell wall and I'm inflamed, ba basically what happens is the water stays outside the cell. Instead of the cell looking like a plump grape, it starts to look like a raisin and everything gets inflamed. So when we look at the inflammation process, it drives weight gain through all of those different mechanisms. And then it drives aging, right? Insulin going up is aging. Inflammation is aging. So we go gray, we get wrinkled, 
we get tired, we start to age more rapidly. So it's also leading to that. And until we can get that inflammation under control, it may be one of the major killers of, why, of, of weight loss at the same time, because we have to be able to get rid of the inflammatory response. So if I go back and I go, okay, I'm going to reduce the sugar out of my diet. I'm not going to eat or drink any caloric drinks that have fructose, a high fructose corn syrup, and I'm going to remove that from my diet. I'm going to reduce and try and get seed oils out as much as possible and use cleaner sources of fats, right? You could use olive oil and salad dressings and things like that, but I want to avoid all of those other seed oils and I can use other avenues in which to cook with. Um, and I'm going to reduce out all of the cookies, crackers, and other things made with crappy oils. And I'm going to avoid alcohol and reduce the chemicals in my diet. And I'm going to get up and get moving and start working on my stress. Because if I do all of those things, it's going to help create an environment for my microbiome to be healthier, and then it's also going to create an environment of less inflammation. And we can do that by eating whole foods in their natural form. It can be cooked or raw, but whole foods in their natural form. Eating clean, lean animal proteins, staying away from processed foods, eating if you are doing grains and legumes, whole grains, whole legumes, ideally cook, sprouting those and then cooking them yourself when you can, just reducing the toxins out of your diet. Because if I can get that inflammation under control, I, I basically reduce all cause mortality risk associated with inflammation. I reduce my weight and I also age more effectively, right? So I hope you found this uh, not only enlightening, but educational. And if you loved it, please share it with a friend because together we rise. And I will see you back next week on Menopause Mastery. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Menopause Mastery Podcast. You are why I'm here, and I am so very grateful. Hit subscribe so you don't miss any wisdom on creating the most exceptional life on our terms. If this episode has helped you in any way, please share it with a friend to spread the love, and together we rise. You can follow me on social media at Betty Murray PhD, and you can reach me online at bettymurray.com. 